Hi everyone. Welcome back to Laquanda's Heart and welcome to the live stream wellness series. I am your host Laquanda and this week we have a special guest with us, Sarah McGinnis, who is going to be talking with us from about self-care. One thing I'm excited about is she's joining us from New Zealand and thank you so much, Sarah, for coming in and being a part of our broadcast this evening. Thank That's you. Thank you for having for me. For us, but it's noon for you. <laughs> it's a lovely time of day. I know, right? <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. So tell us about who Sarah is and um, how are you connected to, to self-care and this whole concept of wellness? Yeah, thank you. Well, yes, thank you again for having me. It's such a pleasure to join you all. Um, yeah, so my name is Sarah McGuinness. I'm a corporate wellbeing specialist down here in New Zealand. Um, and we are lucky down here because, well, we're lucky in many ways because we have such a, a wonderful way of life with the weather and, you know, um, it's really relaxed and the rest of it. But we also in New Zealand have some really big challenges around mental health. And I think we've seen some big changes here in the last five years uh, with the way our health and safety laws have changed, the way that the awareness around mental health has changed. And then my work as a corporate wellbeing specialist has changed as, as it's improved and as we've got a better understanding of what it means to take care and, and the impact, you know, for ourselves and for our loved ones and the people that we work with. So in terms of me and my background, I've been trying to change behaviour my whole career. I started in marketing and then had one of those late night, what am I doing with my life moments? <laughs> and uh, went back and, and studied psychology. And through my psychology journey, I kept focusing on midlife men and women, because for me, it seemed that's a really interesting and challenging part of life. Mm -hmm. So much happens in that time. And, and when you look at the focus where most of the well-being is, it's in that age group. And it's like, you know, you need to eat better. You need to run more. You need to take care of your children better. You need to, you know, support your parents better. And, and then for me, it was, and, you know, that's also the time when our careers are at their peak and we're putting all that energy in. And, and I kept thinking, we just need to give this age group such better support, you know, because there's so much happening. And yet... There's, it's all this personal responsibility stuff. So that's a lot of what I do now is focusing on support for that group and and more specifically, little things that people can do every day, which is really self-care, to help them get through those challenges, get through those day-to-day -day things and actually come out the other side with some energy and a chance to do the things they want to do. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying how I'm involved in self-care. So um, let's just jump right into the discussion. I know that you have mentioned um, mental health and mental well-being. I know here in the States, there is such a, um, it can be such a huge stigma with talking about mental health. Um, there, um, there's people who are ashamed. There's dealing with um, discrimination because you have a mental health condition. There's generalizations people making um, assumptions about who you are and the things that you do. What are some of the things that people in New Zealand are facing when it comes to mental health? Yeah, I think, you know, we've had a really big change as I said over the last five years. And I think partially that's been driven by our government. I mean, we're, we're somewhat lucky in that we have only two levels of government, really, you know, local government and then, and then a national government. Um, and so they've conducted some re research um, across the country in terms of mental health, which has really helped to put a focus on it. And and then second of all, I think um, in just this changing conversations, we've had more and more people come forward and share their stories. Uh, one of them, for example, uh, heads up, I mean, lots of them head up really big, significant organisations here, and they've come forward and shared their story. So I think we're seeing a greater change now in how people feel comfortable talking about it. Where we're seeing still those challenges are probably more on the, the micro level. So, for example, and actually this probably applies to a lot of, say, farmers, for example. You know, in, in New Zealand, our farming community has some really big challenges, particularly with climate change. And, and, and so it's trying to get those communities to feel more comfortable to come forward and say they're struggling and that they need that extra help. Um, so I, I think, you know, broadly we're seeing a lot of change, but yeah, there are some really, some individual communities that are still finding it really difficult. Uh, another one I can think of, you know, a group of communities is Amari and Pacifica. You know, they, 
we know from a healthcare perspective that they have some, um, some inequalities in how they can access healthcare and mental health support. And so that makes it harder to speak up and it makes it harder to put forward and say they're experiencing challenges because when they reach out, it feels like a difficult pathway. There's no kind of easy pathway to get through. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some of the some of the similar things that um, minorities here in the United States face um, when we're dealing with um, what we call cultural competency or cultural humility, having providers that really understand your cultural um, basis and that they're not misinterpreting you know, what's going on with you. Um, for instance, when I grew up, my mother would say, you know, my nerves are bothering me. My nerves are bothering me. But what she was really dealing with was anxiety. And so, you know, you had to be um, aware of that culture to understand that when someone was saying, okay, it's my nerves, that they're trying to communicate or they don't have the language to say, this is depression, this is um, anxiety, you know, my thoughts are racing, you know? And so I think it's for us is having those practitioners in place who have been trained to understand what it, what it means when someone different from them is speaking. So one thing I want, um, us to discuss because this is about self-care and I write about self-care. So this topic is really important to me. So why do you think, and I want to ask you as the expert, why do you think as, as many articles as we see and we read, as many books that are on the bookshelves at bookstores that we can find on Amazon, why do people still tend to put self-care last? That's a really good, good question. And I think it varies right. for different people. Certainly there are some probably bigger trends, you know, across the group, but I'd also say some are individual. One of them I would say is because it comes back to say those in midlife, for example, there are so many things that require our attention in the here and now. You know, as a mum, I can say it's my children, it's, you know, my work, it's, um, you know, dealing with, with things that come up day to day. And, and so consequently, those things, because they're demanding of you, mean that you put your own stuff, you know, further down the priority list. Um, for others, it might be that there is a feeling of guilt around, you know, giving ourselves that, that time. There's, there's somehow associated with if we're spending time on ourselves, even if it looks like downtime, suddenly that's not productive time. And, and in society, we've got this value around time must be productive, must be doing things, you know, the sense of achievement. And yet actually taking that time for ourselves is a sense of achievement. It's just a, you know, it's one that we have to feel comfortable with ourselves. Um, and I also think there are some, some stigma pieces still around what self-care actually is as well. Um, and one of the, the definitions I like to give on self-care is that it's, it's actually a continuum. And so I think often we mistake the, the definition of, of self-care and being that it's, you know, bubble baths or massages, which are really, really nice. But actually, if we look at a continuum, at one end, it is taking those those little things every day, like having a hot drink with a friend or, you know, reading a book or um, it might even be having a long hot shower, for example. As we move further up the continuum, it's actually follow up thing, following up things like um, getting a, a, a medical issue followed up. It might be having a slightly more challenging conversation with a friend. Um, as you move further up, it might actually be learning to say no. And I put that further up the scale because it is a more challenging, you know, as a, as a therapist, it's a more challenging thing to do. But actually, it might be something that's really important for our self-care. And at the other end of the scale, kind of the big end, is actually making some big life changes. And whether that's about making ourselves safe, you know, if we're not in a safe environment, um, it might be moving to be closer with friends or family, you know, moving across the globe, it might be changing careers, it might be all sorts of things. And so I think when we expand the definition out a bit more and we say, well, actually, self-care is about creating a life for myself that enables me to be well, then actually following up a, doc a doctor's appointment, being a self-care activity, doesn't feel so, I don't know, selfish uh, as, as perhaps, you know, reading a book, even though that's still really important. Uh, so I think once we open it up, it makes it a little bit more accessible. But, yeah, certainly I think those feelings around guilt 
around how we spend our time, around our focus and, and what's demanding of us and actually pushing back against that sometimes uh, are things that get in the way. Sarah, how do you, because you, you bring up a great point, you know, it's this continuum and we start off because everyone starts off with those little bitty things that you were talking about, you know, it's like, okay, I need to go get my hair done or I need to, you know, take myself out to dinner. You know, it's like, and we look at those things as self-care, but you know, as therapists, we know, like we said, like you indicated, there's those, those tougher things those things that take a little bit more energy. Why is it that people tend not to translate those bigger things into self-care? We tend to leave those bigger things in, okay, that's not self-care, that's mental health. And, you know, we want to pull away from that, you know, because I don't have a mental health condition. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I can handle everything. Um, but why is it that when it comes to those bigger things, we want to pull away and not really um, engage ourselves on full, complete wellness? Because, you know, there's not, and I don't want to call those little things that we do for ourselves, they're not superficial, but they're the surface layer. You know, it's the surface layer. It's not, you know, it's the, the tip of the iceberg. It's not what's underneath. Why do we want to focus on what's above and ignore what's underneath? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think a lot of it comes down to a couple of things. And one of them is our own comfort. Uh, one of the things I've been um, working on um, is some of the new self-care products. And one of them is about getting people to look at their lives. And it's really interesting when you get people to do it because you immediately feel like you're crossing this barrier. Like, so if, if we have this conversation and I say, I'll say, how are you? And you say, oh, good. And we just continue on. If I, if I turn that round and ask a slightly deeper question, then there's kind of this, oh, that feels really big. That feels really uncomfortable. And so I think it's getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. And and that is a real challenge, but but in terms of mental health, that's kind of where we need to go to grow, right? You know, like when when we talk about, you know, staying in your comfort zone, things never really change. But when we move into that growth zone, that slightly more uncomfortable zone, that's when things start to change for us. So I think, I think yeah, um, I've lost my train of thought, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think really moving into yeah that 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 discomfort is is one of the reasons why it feels like we we don't want to deal with the more um, the more difficult pieces. I think the other part too is it really depends on what it is that's holding us back, you know, from those those more challenging things. And one of the areas that I've been and I don't pretend to be any expert in this, one of the things I've been starting to turn my attention to is around um, family violence and domestic violence. And in New Zealand, we have some just just terrible statistics, and and these are probably you know world over. And so when I talk about making ourselves safe, that is one of those things. But there's so many layers to what making ourselves safe looks like for a lot of people. That might take a little while before they feel ready or able to to make that call. Uh, and so I think that's sometimes why it feels more difficult because there are just that many more layers to it. But it almost, in some ways, is about saying even though those big things at the end of the continuum are big things there are still little things we can translate that are at the bottom of the spectrum that might actually just help us go, I'm, I'm going to chip away at that in a little way. And, and that might be, for example, you know, reaching out to a friend and saying, actually, I might need a little bit of help right now. And that's actually, that is a difficult thing to do for a lot of people. But I think the more that we can start to open up and ask people and respond, that will make that easier. And I think, one thing we have to do, especially if you're the person on the other side, be prepared to receive that person. Because you don't, when a person is reaching out for you, they're not asking you to fix them. They're not asking you to fix them. They're not asking you to take everything, every problem that they're dealing with away. They're asking for support. And so sometimes you have to sit back as like, can I support this person? And what ways can I support them and still remain healthy myself? So it can remain a healthy situation for myself as well. And when you really think about it, we're, a, we're able to offer that person support and then keep our own wellness in check as well. 
because you know when you're supporting someone you need to make sure that you're well i always tell people do not forget what they tell you when you get on the airline put your mask on first then help the person next to you so you want to make sure that you're that you're able to to help someone and if you're not that's okay but if you know where they can go to get help then provide that person with that resource um, because you never know what kind of link that you would you can be in when it comes to someone's life. Um, and, and, I, you guys, okay. and it's a picking up on that. That's almost you know like if if we feel that self care is something that we feel guilty about, then maybe we can frame it that way to say, well, if I look after myself, then when I'm asked to help someone, I actually have the resources within myself to provide that care. And yeah. if that helps in framing it that way, and we go, well, I need to do that. And actually. I mean, you might know this too as a mother, you know when, you're, when your reserves have run out and you're no longer responding in a way that's helpful, <laughs> then, then you know that, that self-care is something that you need to do. And so, yeah, just picking up on your point, I think that helps to reinforce why it is just so important. Most definitely. So we have a question. Um, it says, what types of self-care, and I believe what they're asking, what type of self-care do you um help companies with with regards to their employees and it says maybe we need to do the same thing here so people won't always be so stressed at work <laughs> i think i think workplace stress is everywhere <laughs> yeah before you before you get into that i i really want to tell us a quick story i worked for an organization and one thing i noticed is that when people took off from work they were still emailing, they were still responding to instant messenger. And I would say to myself, you're not off work. And it was so, it was so um, like mind boggling to me that I would literally on messenger say, I am completely unavailable. I am off work. But what, let's get to this question. I'm gonna ask you a question about when it comes to success and, and self care. So what type of um, work do you do with companies um, as for, with regards to employees as far as helping with, with self-care, Sarah? Really good question. So I actually work at different levels. So probably almost, I was going to say my favorite level, but that's not true because <laughs> when you love what you do, all of it's your favorite. Um, but the top is actually working with senior leaders and taking that step back and taking an organizational approach to well-being. Because once you start doing that, you actually build self-care into the way that people work and into their relationships with colleagues and into the culture. And that completely changes how people experience work. And you're absolutely right. When people leave work, they feel like they've done their day, they can walk away, and there's no pressure or expectation that they have to you know, respond to emails. And so that in itself is, is self-care. So that's probably the, the best way of doing it because it means then everybody in the workplace gets to be involved in that. Um, the second level down is then I do workshops with organizations and, and the main one seems to be living your best life, which is really interesting. And that's me telling the story of my dad who was a, um, a chief financial officer of a large New Zealand organization for 18 years. And that was all fine, except that when he retired, he's now having to undo the effects of all those years of stress and it is manifested in every single way that you can imagine so he has it's, it's actually almost like a PTSD and I've done the research of the literature there's nothing out there so I'm you know I'm associating something in which there's no literature about but he's having nightmares about it he has all these phantom symptoms and and he's so hardwired for stress now that the tiniest thing that shouldn't be stressful is incredibly stressful for him and so when I tell that story, you know, and his his reflections on to his younger self, you know, if he could go back now, knowing what he knows, what would he do differently? And that for him, one is about learning to manage stress, recognizing your triggers and then learning to manage it. And I don't just mean so for dad, dad, like on, on paper, he did all the right things. So he exercised regularly. Um, most of his career was the days before email, so you know you weren't able to be woken up by the email in the middle of the night. Um, we went on family holidays, like a rundown old farmhouse that was kind of like an escape. But the biggest thing for him was that he never learnt to deal with the cognitive side of stress. So never learnt to actually, you know, all those things we talk about, you know, the the mindfulness, the um, 
you know, reframing all those important skills that we have in psychology, none of, none of those things. The other piece too was because he was so senior in his organization, he um, he found it really difficult to ask for help. And he says now he, he, he wish he had a mentor, somebody he could talk to. Uh, and so when I go through the tips to individuals or, or to busy professionals, part of those tips are around the, the behavioral things you can do, the cognitive things you can do, and, and just that importance of relationships with other people and that trust and that ability to connect and have those real conversations. You know, I say it's like, you know, loving someone in all their glory. <laughs> it's having those people in your life that you can just be, you know, blah, and they still listen to you, they love you, they hold you to account, they still keep you grounded, but they're also like that safety net for you as well. Um, and then the last piece I do is then I have little self-care cards and I know quite a few organizations have brought them and their HR staff or their health and safety staff use them to help facilitate conversations around self-care. I think one thing you just went dived into my question more because I was like because I was going to ask you how does the quest for success impact self-care in the work? Mm, such a good question and I think this is you know it, it's a really challenging one because what drives us for success is is individual to each of us I mean there is certainly society or western society has some big things around what achievement and success looks like with maybe you know money and cars and stuff but you know as we talk about in well-being that stuff doesn't actually make you happy you know it's, it, it's for some people it, it, it might do but we know that the richest people aren't necessarily the happiest people. Um, so I think, you know, I'd like to think that success in its definition is changing somewhat as, as the new generation comes through and they want to have a social impact. And I hope that that will start to change what we define success as. So I think we, yes, that current definition of success and achievement and money and attainment and, and titles and all those things are just, extra stresses that don't necessarily add anything tangible or meaningful other than being nice on the wall. <laughs> I'm, that might be just my colored view, but, um, but I, I hope that's where we're going. But I know, you know, one thing we have to be careful, especially those of us who are parents, is that we're not teaching our children how to not deal with stress and that we're not setting them up to where, you know, they're accepting careers because I have to be careful because my child is about to is in high school you know a couple of years away from college she's really really good in math and science excellent is easy to her comes a breeze to her and I was like you're gonna get a STEM degree and she's like no and I was like but you're really good at this and she's like I don't like it and I'm like but you're brilliant at it and she and she's like, I like writing. And, and so, you know, as as a parent, you know, we have to be careful that we're not instilling in our children that, OK, you go after this quest for success and that you're not going to be able to develop or build a life for yourself if you don't go down this particular pattern. And so a particular road. And we have to not put that pressure on our kids where they're stressed out not necessarily because of what they're doing, but because what we say they should be doing. Totally. Yeah, totally. And we always say, because I'm the oldest of three children and my husband is the oldest. So we always say to our oldest, I'm so sorry. You know, you've got two oldest, you're high achieving parents. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> just, you know, it's like, we, you, you know, we have to look at it like at what point do adults start feeling stress? It's not as adults. It's during that childhood phase where they are first introduced with stress and they learn how to deal with that from us. Totally. By us, by hearing how we respond to stress and how we respond to them when they're in stressful situations. Suck it up. You can deal with it. You're tough. You know, all these toxic words, you know, that in our minds, they don't feel as if they can be toxic. But as they're growing up and they're developing, they're not learning how to truly deal with stress as it comes. 
they're learning to, I need to just push it down, push it down, push it down because I need to just chase this thing called success. And, totally. you know, push myself to the side in order to obtain this, because like you said, you know, there's this notion when I obtain this thing, when I make this amount, then I'm going to be happy. But a lot of people get to that phase, get to that stage, and then something's missing and they're not well. They're not That's well. exactly right. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to self-care, Sarah? I was just, can I touch on one of the things you just said earlier? Yeah, I was just thinking, and I think that's one of the things is is learning to manage expectation. Because I think that's that's kind of what we're touching on, isn't it? It's the expectations we put on the children and mm. the expectations we feel are put on us as parents. And and the, the biggest thing we can do both for ourselves and for our children is is learn to verbalize those expectations. So they become less of a phantom thing sitting on our shoulders and actually something that we communicate, we talk about. Uh, for example, my husband and I always laugh about this. Being the mother, for some reason, I seem to be the one that always ends up with the, you know, the cooking things for school and the swimming togs and the, you know, all the other extracurricular stuff that seems to, to come. And so my husband, I always laugh about it being the mental load. So whenever it comes up where it's like, oh, here's the mental load. <laughs> And so by talking about it, it actually becomes, because what you're recognizing is that as a mother, there are this, there's this set of expectations, you know, that you're supposed to live up to and that if you achieve them all, therefore you are, are a good mother. Mm -hmm. But actually that's, that's not true. We know that being a good parent is actually being present with your children. It's about survive, giving them a safe house and, you know, food to eat. Yes. <laughs> the really basic building blocks. And, and so same for our children. It's, it's, it's also being clear about those expectations and, and why we have them. So, you know, with our children, my son has been, he's really tired, you know, end of school. And he keeps saying, I just don't want to go. I'm too tired. And I have to keep saying, it's only a couple of weeks left of school. The reason you need to go is X, Y, Z. And he's at an age appropriate now where I can do that. Um, but, but spelling her out and taking him on that journey so that he understands the reason that I'm being draconian about it is not because I'm some <laughs> some mother who's, you know, pushing him to do it, but actually because it's, it's you know, there's a really valid reason behind it. Um, and then dealing with the anxiety, I think we can do the same thing. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't always respond the best to my children. And so it's then about, as a parent, saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not having a great day. Mummy's really tired. I went to bed really late because I was working on a big project. I'm really sorry that I was like that. Um, you know, what can we do together to fill your bucket again? And and then usually my son will say something or my daughter, you know, that, about, oh, you know, you hurt me when you did that. And we can talk about that and then move forward. And they learn those skills to go, hey, parents aren't perfect. Hey, children aren't mm -hmm. perfect. We all have crappy days. But actually, here's some really solid things we can do together and so I think that actually the communication is just the most important part so that was a whole tangent but I thought it was I just know, important but I ever. agree with you I agree with you my my daughter I had to learn how to talk to her differently because the way that I would talk to her and I would talk to her her mind computed it as mommy's yelling at me and I was like but I don't yell at you she said but it hurts me to my core so I had to figure out a different way to communicate with her because every time I would tell her something, she would take it so personally. And, you know, as parents, we're taught that, okay, we, you know, it's my way or the highway, you know, is, um, you know, this is what's going to be said. And we just, you know, this is, this is just it. I don't care anything about your feelings, but, you know, I had to realize I need to care about her feelings because I need her to know that I care about her feelings so that she grows up knowing that her feelings, her emotions and the things that she say is valid. And that's where they get that. They get that from us. They learn that from us. And as they integrate into these different systems and to work um, workplaces as adults, they're able to communicate and have that voice that, hey, what I have to say is valid here. 
Totally. You know, so it's, important. it's nothing worse than being in a job and you don't feel like your voice is valid. Talking about some workplace stress. <laughs> totally, totally. It's funny you say that because I used to work in leadership development. And what I found was that it was almost like everyone bought their baggage to work and was trying to work it out at work. It's almost like, you know, if, if you feel like you're looking for validation, people tend to look for validation from their boss or from other people. And so don't consequently speak up. I mean, like I'm hugely generalizing, but, but it's almost like by giving our children exactly as you say, that sense that they're valid, that, you know, that confidence to use their voice and to speak up, but also that, um, that ability to be human and 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 vocalize when that you know they've messed up and and that's okay and you know we move forward together is just so important imagine how different the workplace would be if, if everyone could do that yeah right if everyone could could do that if everyone felt like their voice had some say at the table and at the end of the day that's all a person a person people want to be seen and they want to be heard and they want to feel valued in the process. That's something that can be so easily given. But for some reason, you know, it's not, you know, these power plays and, you know, this climbing up the ladder of what people, I can go on a tangent about how people define the success, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> and how that impacts our overall wellness. We'll save that for another conversation. <laughs> Um, but um, what are you, going back to our question, what are some Ooh. misconceptions that people have about self-care, Sarah? Yeah, definitely the first one is that it's some kind of kind of nice to have, very, very floaty, you know, way to waste a lot of money and is very expensive and, you know, just a, you know, a, a nice to have. Um, certainly that the first, yeah, absolutely not. Self-care is, is as fundamental as I was going to say brushing your teeth, but actually brushing your teeth is self-care. So <laughs> there you go. You're already doing self-care every day. Um, but it's absolutely one of the foundational you know, pieces of life that we need to ensure that we can look after ourselves and have that energy to do the things we need to do. The second second one that comes up a lot is that about you know being selfish, that if I'm taking time for myself, that's selfish. Um, and again, you know, it's it's not. It's by having that time to look after ourselves and recharge. You know, we, as I keep saying, we have the energy to do the things we need to do, and part of that is we have the energy for the relationships in our life, are, which are really important. And as we talked about earlier, when we have that energy for good relationships, then we can be there for other people to support them in their time of need. So, in many ways, it's not selfish only for ourselves, but also for the people in our lives. Interestingly enough, one of the things I've seen come through more recently is um, there's a couple of news articles, and I think actually one of them was in the New York Times, um, and it's around, oh, well, self-care is so last year, you know, we shouldn't be spending our money on all these, you know, self-care things, and um, let's just do away with that and, and build some resilience again, which to me was like, well, one, you know, we know how important self-care is for health. Would you say that to people going through really difficult medical treatment or, or trauma? You know, I'll just give up self-care? That made no sense to me. And then and the other part is, um, you know, resilience comes from self-care. Resilience comes from recognising where we are in life and the things that we need, acknowledging that, having compassion for ourselves and making choices about what we're going to do to move forward. So I think... I think self the definition of self-care, I think, has got lost sometimes in, in the way society views it. And actually, so rather than seeing it as a yeah, foundational building block, they just see it as some kind of fluffy thing, which is unfortunate. And I hope it will change. Yeah, most definitely. So um, in closing, because we're going to wrap up because I don't mm -hmm. want to keep you long. Let's say I'm a person and right now I want to start my self-care journey. I don't know where to go. I don't want to read a thousand books, you know, I, but I know that something needs to shift. Um, I'm not doing well as work as, a, as I should be. You know, home seems frustrating for me. I haven't found my safe space yet. Where do I start? It's a really, really good question. And I would almost jump to a solution being... If you write down the top five or 10 things that make you feel good, 
So think about what thoughts make you feel good. Think about what physical activities make you feel good, what foods make you feel good, what people make you feel good, what you know, music makes you feel good, what places make you feel good. You know, we talk about play spaces. So where in the world makes you feel like you're most yourself? You're the library, you know, out on the water, up in the hills. Identify those places and the more that as even as a foundational building block, you can start to build some of those things in. What you're doing is you're starting to give your your body a bit of a break from that and you're you're giving yourself that chance to renew and rejuvenate in things that make you feel good as you do more of that and you start to feel good then then you can start to to delve i think more into unpicking the bigger problems but you almost need that foundational base first before going right now i want to deal with all the challenges at work now i want to deal with all the challenges at home because each of those will demand energy from you and you need to have that energy source first all right that's an excellent excellent response <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you so much sarah um for joining us this evening to discuss uh, self-care as we appreciate your time because i know you have a sick babe that you need to take care of and i'm so glad that you just gave us a moment of your time tonight if if anyone wanted to contact you how can they find you so my web address is www.sarahmcginnis.co.nz. Yeah, I could, you could probably um, give you the link to that too, if that's helpful. I won't spell it. <laughs> <laughs> and how do we find you on social media? So I'm take care at, oh, sorry, it should be take care by Sarah McGinnis <laughs> with the at on Instagram. And then on Facebook, it's Sarah McGinnis Wellness. So I'd be delighted awesome. to see people and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. If you're interested and know someone who may be interested in being a guest on the live stream wellness series, reach out to me at laquandasheart at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram at laquandasheart. Thank you so much and we'll catch you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Hold on.